At about 1.30, container ships struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Officials at the scene estimate eight people were unaccounted for still. Not still, were unaccounted for. That number might change. Two have been rescued, one without injury, one in critical condition. And the search and rescue operation is continuing for all those remaining as we speak. At this time, we have no other indication, no other reason to believe there's any intentional act here. Authorities are investigating the cause of the Baltimore Bridge collapse after a cargo ship hit it earlier. More on that. Uh, also, as Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg saying that he has been in close contact with Governor Moore, Wes Moore, a Democrat of Maryland, uh, as well as Baltimore's mayor. Joining me now is The Hill's Brett Samuels. Brett, I mean, President Biden, he says infrastructure is so important to him. Now infrastructure clearly has the attention of the White House with this bridge collapse. Absolutely. This is going to be front and center for the White House for days, weeks, possibly months to come. This is a major bridge uh, for, for commerce, for transportation up here in the Northeast. So this is going to be a, a big focus for, for the president in the White House. As you said, the president has made infrastructure really central to his pitch to voters that he wants to fix roads, fix bridges, fix railways. Uh, we heard him say this afternoon that he wants the federal government to cover the full cost of replacing this bridge and that he expects Congress to essentially pass legislation to do that. So we'll see that in the coming days, I'm sure, as soon as Congress is back from recess. Uh, but certainly, you know, a tragic event this morning and, and the president out in front of it in touch with local officials. He'll be there in the coming days, it sounds like. And uh, Pete Buttigieg, the transportation secretary, is up there in the meantime. And so when you look at these images, I mean, it's, it's captured the attention of the entire nation, just as you see this, this horrific, horrific uh, incident where you have this seemingly uh, just completely unprecedented thing where you've got a, a cargo ship in the middle of the night on a heavily populated bridge. We've all gone back and forth that thing, if you are on the East Coast, many times uh, out of Baltimore, and now it's gone. Uh, and it comes at a time in which the infrastructure funding across the country, trying to update and modernize, use uh, technology to be able to, to look at these things. I mean, there is no doubt, Brett Samuels, that lawmakers up on Capitol Hill, when they do return from recess, they're going to be pulling in the CEO of that cargo ship to understand precisely what went wrong to have this. Uh, it, it's no different than what happened with Boeing. Uh, and that company is going to have severe questions to answer for. What do you think, what are your sources telling you is going to happen on Capitol Hill from where this story goes from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, it sounds like there will certainly be questions for this company about how this happened. Now, what Governor Westmore and other officials on the ground in Baltimore have said is that this ship managed to put out a mayday call uh, that they were having these issues before it crashed into the bridge. And Wes Moore and some other folks in Maryland have said that that actually likely helped save lives because it allowed authorities to shut down traffic going across the bridge just before it collapsed. Uh, but certainly a lot of questions raised about why this, this uh, error happened, how this ship uh, ran into the bridge that led to its collapse. And I'm sure we'll be hearing uh, from both the White House and from lawmakers on Capitol Hill uh, making sure that this company is held accountable uh, for, for any role it may have played here. Governor Westmore, clearly a rising star within the Democratic Party, out his first big national test as the attention and the spotlight uh, are on him for this. So uh, great reporting on that front. Switching gears, President Biden bouncing back in the polls, according to a new Bloomberg morning consult poll, shows that Biden has narrowed the lead and narrowed the gap, rather, in six out of seven battleground states just within the last couple of weeks. Now, Biden still trails Trump among all voters in the seven battleground state, but Biden leads Trump by one percentage point in Wisconsin, and he's tied with Trump in Pennsylvania and Michigan. Brett, I mean, what gives? Why the momentum shift for Biden? Yeah, I think you have to look at a few things here, Kevin. One uh, that the poll found is that Biden did actually get a bump post State of the Union, the White House and the campaign had told me that they viewed the State of the Union as sort of a starting gun for this general election campaign. And clearly, President Biden did see a boost from that with uh, Democrats in particular rallying around him, giving him positive marks, viewing that speech as fiery and energetic, which is what Biden needed to convey to voters, obviously, with concerns about his age. Uh, and then the other piece of it is Biden campaign officials had told me that they believed that polls would come around to their side once voters realized more fully 
that former President Trump was the Republican nominee, that he would be on the ballot in November. Uh, and I think part of that is what you're seeing here, because this poll found that a majority of Biden voters actually say that their vote is against Trump. So certainly we're seeing a, a couple motivating factors here as Biden narrows the gap and even pulls ahead uh, in the case of Wisconsin. I mean, Hillary lost 2016 because of the blue wall and it didn't hold. Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. So for the Democrats, Biden, uh, he's they're saying that he's got to win Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. These polls seemingly indicate some signs of life for the Biden campaign uh, as it relates to those three battleground states. Yeah, you know, the Biden campaign, what they've told me is that they believe that their their money advantage in particular uh, at this this juncture of the race gives them sort of the options where they can be aggressive in states like Nevada, states like Georgia, Arizona, even North Carolina, where the president is traveling today. Uh, but at the end of the day, as you said, you know, the blue wall is kind of the bread and butter for the Democrats, where if Biden wins Michigan, he wins Wisconsin, he wins Pennsylvania. The rest of those states are not nearly as important. So we're seeing uh, the Biden campaign invest a lot of time and resources there. We've seen Biden travel to all three of those states. Uh, and I would expect that those three states will be really front and center for the rest of the general election campaign here. Is Biden going to wear a Duke or a Tar Heel jersey when he's in North Carolina? Why not an NC State jersey? You know, the underdogs. Uh, hey, the you know what? Well played. Deep run. You know what? Hey, by the way, NC State, Duke. Or Tar Heels, what's he going to wear? I guess that's too political for the president in order to weigh in, too partisan, I guess. What's going on in Nevada? Trump was up six, and now he's only up two. Uh, Nevada would, would, that's a state Democrats would love to win in 2020, or 2024. Absolutely. That's going to be a really closely contested state. Uh, uh, you know, the Biden campaign, again, this gets back to what they were saying, that they felt confident that once voters realized this was a Biden versus Trump election, that voters would rally to their side to narrow the gap. That's what we're seeing in Nevada with Biden making gains there. Uh, Biden himself traveled to Nevada in the last couple of weeks. His campaign has been setting up operations there, investing in the state, which is something that the Trump campaign has not done yet. Uh, so we're seeing that ground game potentially make a difference. Uh, but ultimately, Latino voters are going to play a big role in Nevada. Some polling has shown that Trump is making gains with those voters. So that's going to be a big focus for the Biden campaign moving forward to make sure that they have uh, you know, strong investments to to turn out the Latino vote and make sure that they're energizing those voters. See, you and I were talking about this earlier because it's actually the reverse effect in Georgia, which, of course, is home to the election interference case. Trump has expanded his lead, according to this Bloomberg Morning Consult poll, by one percentage point in the state, arguably, where there is one of the most controversial uh, cases and the legal front that that pres former President Trump faces. So why do you think he's been able to grow his lead Trump has in Georgia? Yeah, well, certainly, you know, I think the the case you mentioned in Fulton County with D.A. Fonnie Willis and sort of the controversy that she's landed in has certainly just juiced uh, support amongst those who are already loyal to Trump. So I think he has seen a boost in that sense. Uh, but Georgia is kind of an interesting state. I think it is a tough one for the Biden campaign. Obviously, Biden won that state in 2020 by roughly 10,000 votes. But that was the first time in decades that a Democrat had won that state. It's really a traditional Republican state. You've got a Republican governor and Brian Kemp who's extremely popular, even though Trump has attacked Brian Kemp. Uh, so this is a state where Trump himself and the Trump campaign has signaled to me uh, that they feel confident about their chances in Georgia. Uh, and the Biden campaign, you know, President Biden traveled to Atlanta just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but this is a state where certainly they have some ground to make up. And they're really going to need to mobilize black voters, suburban voters, uh, and that coalition that helped just narrowly put them over the top in 2020. Switching gears now, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, she had a major court development just in the last 24 hours. What do we know? So a court in London has essentially paused this planned extradition for Julian Assange to the United States. Uh, it seemed like we were going to get a resolution to this years-long case where U.S. officials had been seeking his extradition on espionage charges. Uh, but a London court basically is now giving the U.S. three weeks or so to provide assurances about his treatment if he is extradited, uh, make sure that he's got First Amendment protections, that he won't face the death penalty, that he'll be treated fairly in the courts. Uh, so to be continued on this case, which has certainly been in the headlines and captured attention for, for years on end, really. Meanwhile, back here in the U.S., the Supreme Court set to hear oral arguments today in the abortion pill case. What's at stake with regards to abortion pills, and when are they expected to rule? Yeah, so this case could have really huge ripple effects nationwide, depending on which way the Supreme Court comes down on this. 
uh, hearing arguments about access to mifepristone, which is one of two FDA approved drugs, uh, abortion medication drugs on the market. Uh, and this group of anti-abortion doctors are, are basically, you know, trying to get this drug taken off the market. Um, so if the Supreme Court rules in their favor, that could be huge effects for the accessibility to this drug nationwide. Obviously, a handful of states already rolling back abortion access. What we're expecting is that the Supreme Court will rule by the end of June. So we still have a couple of months before we may hear a final decision here. And early indications are that justices seem skeptical to the arguments from the group that brought this lawsuit seeking to ban Mifepristone, largely on the grounds of standing. There was some skepticism from justices, even conservatives, about whether the group that brought this lawsuit really had the standing or could show that they were harmed uh, by access to this drug. So we'll see in the coming weeks and months how this plays out, but certainly one to watch uh, and one with big election ramifications. And what are your sources at the White House telling you about uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's decision to pull the Israeli delegation from their planned visit to Washington, D.C., as a result of the U.S. Uh, abstaining from that U.N. Security Council vote earlier? Definitely some confusion, some frustration, I think, uh, coming from the White House, from what I've been told. Uh, you know, officials at the White House are, are basically saying that they feel like this is a missed opportunity for Israel to have this dialogue, to send officials to talk about this planned uh, military operation in Rafah that Israel is looking ahead toward, that U.S. officials have made clear that they are not supportive of. They feel like this is a mistake, that there are other ways for Israel to go about this. Uh, but it's really just another crack in this relationship between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, White House officials have told me that there is this sort of frustration that uh, Netanyahu has just kind of, uh, you know, ignored publicly, at least, these warnings about the Rafah invasion. Uh, but one White House official did tell me that they believe in private these messages may be uh, having an effect. You know, they pointed to the fact that Israel has not gone forward with this Rafah invasion uh, as, as evidence that the White House's messaging is working in private. But uh, certainly the lack of this delegation and the anger from Netanyahu and his team uh, is something that bears watching. Uh, in terms of how damaged this relationship might be moving forward. It's a long way to go before you just turn around the plane, quite honestly. I mean, if they were already here, why not just have the meeting? But I digress. Before I let you go, Congresswoman Claudia Tenney of New York, she's a Republican, she said that at the rate Republicans are going, Hakeem Jeffries is going to be Speaker of the House. Is she right? Uh, I don't know that I'd go as far as Congresswoman Tenney, but, you know, the spirit of her message is definitely accurate, I think. We've seen Republicans, uh, you know, resigning left and right, and that's narrowed their majority to just one seat at this point. So, you know, you you can never predict life. You don't know what's going to happen. Who knows what happens if uh, if another Republican gets some, you know, job offer they can't pass up on that they want to resign, uh, or, or something else happens that further narrows their majority. Now, we will see a couple special elections, including. Uh, to replace the former Speaker Kevin McCarthy that should pad Republicans' majority ever so slightly. Uh, but Congresswoman Tenney's message is well taken that Republicans are really, uh, you know, they're, they're taking their chances here with, with having such a thin majority at this point. Hey, Brett Samuels, we're going to leave it there. Excellent reporting as always. The Hills, Brett Samuels. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Kevin. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton scored a major legal victory after reaching a deal to dismiss security fraud charges after nine years. Prosecutors announced the agreement this week as part of the deal, Paxton must pay roughly $300,000 in restitution to victims, complete 100 hours of community service, and 15 hours of legal ethics education. The resolution allows the Texas Attorney General to avoid a trial, which was set to begin on April 15th, the same day, mind you, as former President Donald Trump's hush money trial that's also set to start in New York. Paxton was first indicted in 2015 and faced life in prison after being accused of duping investors in a tech startup before he was elected Attorney General. MSNBC star Rachel Maddow criticized her network bosses on her own MSNBC show for their decision to hire former Republican National Committee chairwoman Ronna McDaniel as a political commentator. Maddow said that the fact that McDaniel is on the payroll at NBC News is inexplicable. Other NBC employees, including former Meet the Press anchor Chuck Todd, have criticized the decision as well. Joining me now with the latest is The Hill's Judy Kurtz. Judy. I mean, did NBC execs see this coming? I'm reading from Dylan Byers over on Puck News that they're pulling the plug on her. What's going on? 
Well, talk about fouling one's own nest uh, at the Peacock Network over there. Totally self-inflicted wound by the suits uh, over at NBC News. Um, and I don't think they saw the optics of this coming. Certainly, uh, I have never seen before multiple anchors, anchor after anchor, coming on their own air, blasting their own bosses for this decision to hire McDaniel. Uh, now we're seeing apparently McDaniel might be out a very short tenure over there. Uh, at NBC News, but I think it's really the, the best choice in order to stop the bleeding and uh, stop this ongoing saga from continuing. But see, what I don't understand is that, okay, and again, I'm nonpartisan, but if you disagree with whomever the guest is, wouldn't you want to interview that guest? I mean, if, you, if you're, that, I, I don't understand the, the logic. I think that folks need to hear from the other side. That's what got this country into this mess is we stopped listening to one another. We got to listen to one another. And as journalists, we got to ask questions of folks. So I, I don't I don't really understand the disconnect, not between Ronna McDaniel and the anchors of, of the, the network, but really the, the C-suite and the anchors, because it, I don't know. I, am I reading too much into this? I think the real miscalculation here was that it's not unusual to hire the former RNC uh, chairwoman as an on-air uh, contributor. That has certainly been done before, many times uh, been done before to get their insight and to get another point of view. I think where the misstep here for a lot of folks over at NBC was that uh, they see her, her critics see her as having been involved in uh, trying to scheme to steal the uh, the 2020 election or return the results of the 2020 election um, in hand with uh, former President Trump. And it's not just the anchors who seem to have a problem with this hiring. I think we should point out that a lot of the uproar over uh, Ronna McDaniel joining the network was from the viewers who, like many of the left-leaning uh, personalities on MSNBC, can't stand Trump and don't want to see her on the airwaves. You know, I don't know. I, I just, news is supposed to be about interviewing people. I guess I'm old school. Buffalo's Tim Russert. He would interview anybody. You know what I mean? I mean, and, and in this day and age, we're so sharply divided, but we're also so closely divided. I mean, just look at the balance of power in the House of Representatives. You don't have to look much further than that. And so I think that it's important for journalists to be able to interview uh, folks that who cares who cares what the journalist's opinion is you got to be able to ask the tough questions to anybody regardless of their political affiliation but that what do i know i guess i'm old school another story that i know you're following for us is sean combs what's going on with p diddy yeah, this saga with uh, P. Diddy seemingly started last year when his ex-girlfriend Cassie came out with these public accusations, very disturbing allegations of uh, sexual harassment and sex trafficking. That was wrapped up very quickly. The next day, they apparently settled that case. But since then, it opened the floodgates for more allegations of sexual misconduct against Diddy. And then we're learning that the Department of Homeland Security just yesterday raiding his homes in Los Angeles, in Miami, part of a sex trafficking investigation. I should point out that uh, the feds are remaining very tight-lipped about this investigation, have not accused him at this point of any wrongdoing, but never a good sign when the feds are knocking on your door. I don't think they're going to be offering to water his plans, get his mail. Uh, <laughs> things are not no. looking too good for Diddy right now. No. And what's this Prince Harry I'm reading might be somehow wrapped into this? Yeah, he was named as part of um, one of the um, the lawsuits against Diddy, not in, in terms of any of the sex trafficking violations or anything um, of that sort. But he his name did come up as part of one of the lawsuits. Not a good look for Prince Harry or, uh, well, anyway, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, Judy Kurtz, thanks so much for keeping us up to speed on everything that we need to know in the know. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Kevin. Yep. Happy tax season, folks. Did you see this? The IRS says that Americans are leaving more than a billion bucks on the table. Can you believe it? More than 940,000 Americans have until May 17th to submit tax returns for unclaimed refunds for the tax year 2020, that horrible year. Otherwise, the money goes away. So go check. I think there's a lot of people who deserve a refund after the year 2020. 
Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has signed one of the most restrictive social media bans for minors in the nation. Under the Florida legislation, minors under the age of 14 years old will not be allowed to have social media accounts. 14 and 15 year olds will need parental approval in order to have accounts. It's likely that the legislation will be challenged in the courts, but it's the first time that a state has taken such sweeping action. It's going to go into effect on January 1st of 2025. The bill would ban addictive social media features like autoplay videos that hook people of all ages, mind you, online. Donald Trump is going public. The former president's truth social media platform merged with Digital World Acquisition Corp. And now Trump Media will trade on the NASDAQ exchange under the stock symbol DJT. It could mean a potential billion dollar windfall for Trump, who is now the presumptive Republican nominee for president. And just at the last check of trading, it was trading at about $70 a share. At pre-market trading, it was trading at about $50 a share. So it's gone up a little bit. That's it for today's Daily Debrief. My name is Kevin Cirilli. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.